Let's talk about the best foods to clean out your liver, or shall we say, just make the liver cleaner? Because many of us don't realize that the liver is not like a sponge that holds toxins. It's a organ that detoxifies, it removes toxins, unless you have a fatty liver. So three different problems with the liver. You can have a fatty liver, you can have an inflamed liver or a combination, and then that inflammation creates uh, scar tissue and then you can develop cirrhosis. So the question is like, what type of foods could you eat to make the liver healthier and cleaner? Let me just first briefly touch on what the liver does. I'm not gonna go through all 500 functions, but it does um, a lot. It actually turns ammonia into urea. So if there's a problem with the liver, you get this backup of ammonia and you can even actually smell it on, on someone's breath. Sometimes when you go to like a nursing home, you, it smells like ammonia. That is what's happening. Liver damage, it's backing up. It can go onto the brain and create a lot of toxicity. So that's one thing it does. It helps detoxify ammonia, which comes from certain protein metabolism breakdown. And then we get the next one, the buffering of hormones. There's certain things in the liver that help buffer hormones. So if they're too much or they're too little, uh, the body will regulate the amount of active form of a certain hormone um, based on the needs, especially estrogen, cortisol, and even testosterone. So for example, if you have cirrhosis of the liver, you can get a uh, massive buildup of estrogen. And if you're male and you're older and you have cirrhosis of the liver, your skin becomes very, very smooth. You lose body hair. You might get man boobs, creating all sorts of estrogenic effects your cortisol can go up. You can be stressed because there's something in your liver that helps buffer cortisol. And because estrogen goes higher, you become lower with testosterone. So there goes your muscles. There goes your get up and go. There goes your libido. Okay, T4, that is the inactive form of the thyroid hormone. Did you realize that 80% of the activation of the thyroid hormone into this active T4 three happens through your liver. So it goes from T4 to T3. So we need a healthy liver to make that conversion. If that doesn't happen, you start developing hypothyroidism. Growth hormone, which is the anti-aging hormone, it has everything to do with uh, proteins, building proteins, helping you sleep at night, longevity. Uh, that hormone works through the liver as well. And there's kind of like an extension of growth hormone. It's called IGF-1, which does uh, similar functions, if not identical functions of the growth hormone. So if there's a problem with the liver, growth hormone doesn't seem to work that well. Then we have vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is activated by the liver and the kidney. So without a good uh, liver function, you don't get the benefit of the active form of vitamin D. And even when they check the blood, they always check the inactive form. They don't check the active form of vitamin D. They're checking the inactive form assuming that it's being converted. But what if the liver and the kidneys are damaged, okay? You're not gonna be able to get a true picture of what's going on with vitamin D if you're just measuring the inactive form of vitamin D. But one of the main functions of the liver is to detoxify toxins and poisons to harmless water-soluble particles. So whether that's pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, heavy metals, or even toxins from cigarettes or alcohol or processed foods, your body tends to break that down. If this liver function doesn't work, you get a backup of toxicity. There's also a function of producing bile to help you extract the fat-soluble nutrients from the food, including omega-3, vitamin A, D, E, and K. So without this, you're gonna have all sorts of problems with nutrients and uh, being able to create an anti-inflammatory effect because the omega-3 just can't go into the body, can't work. Next one is glycogen. That's stored glucose in your liver. So the liver holds glycogen to allow you to uh, run off that fuel between meals. And so let's say, for example, your liver is fatty or it's dysfunctional, you have cirrhosis and you can't run off glycogen between meals. You're gonna have issues with your brain because your brain doesn't store glycogen. It depends on the liver glycogen or whatever you ate for its fuel unless you're on the ketogenic diet, in which you're gonna live off the ketones that are gonna generate it. But a lot of these ketones are generated from the liver. So again, we're gonna have a problem with fuel if the liver is damaged, especially for your brain and other cells. Immune function. Until recently, I did not know 
of the magnitude of how important the liver is for your immune system. You have specialized immune cells in the liver. You have a lot of different uh, uh, lymphatic sinuses in the liver that help you from all sorts of different angles for your immune system. And so the more we lose the liver function, the more we lose the immune function. There are some really key things you want to avoid first because you can eat a lot of healthy foods, but if you're eating these at the same time, uh, the liver is just not going to work that well. And I'm not going to get into the obvious stuff like alcohol, like regular sugar, things like that. I want to get into some hidden things that you need to be aware of. Number one, soy protein isolates. Okay, that's in a lot of different foods. Now, if you do research on this, probably the first five pages in Google, you'll see that it's all healthy for the liver. It's totally fine. I don't buy that because I've had people when I was in practice come in and be on a certain diet for a, a bit of time. And in that diet, it was a weight loss diet. And one of the diets was called Ideal Protein. There's many others, but there are a lot of weight loss programs that have this as their main protein. It's low fat, highly refined uh, protein in soy. And the way they process it, there's nothing that's going to resemble the actual soybean itself. So anyway, here's what I've noticed. After someone being on this diet, being exposed to soy protein isolates for a period of time, I notice that a common denominator is their liver. They have a lot of liver issues like gallbladder issues, right lower abdomen heaviness and pain. And uh, some people had to go to the doctor and have their gallbladders removed. So I can't buy that something, that process can be good for the liver because the liver uh, thrives on things that are like whole foods, not refined foods. So I would read the ingredients and avoid soy protein isolates. Soy protein meal might be good for animals, especially if they take out the, uh, the fats out of it so it doesn't turn rancid. But for humans, I don't think it's the best protein. The next thing is seed oils, highly processed and it's processed with uh, hexane, which is a solvent. But that exposure of this highly uh, refined fat, omega-6 fatty acid, yes, we have oxidative stress, we have inflammation, but I think also it's replacing our cells. It's going deep into the tissue. It's not a natural thing, but we consume so much of it. All right, the next food I would definitely avoid, and you probably already know this, high fructose corn syrup, but what you probably didn't know, they're not starting out making this high fructose corn syrup with this you know, sweet corn that people eat during the summer, right? They don't start out with that. They use what's called dent corn or field corn. It's completely inedible. I don't care how much butter you put on that corn or you add salt. It's disgusting. And the majority of corn grown is this field corn to fatten cattle, right? To make the meat marbly. What is it doing to us? And they also use it for high fructose corn syrup, and glucose syrup, and the modified starches. And so they start with this inedible corn, okay? And they go through probably like 18 different steps. I don't even know the exact number, but it's a lot of different steps. And they're taking the protein out and they're breaking it down with enzymes and acids. And then they add this chemical to it and that chemical, and they use high heats. At the end of this chain of event, you get something that does not resemble anything related to corn. And we're putting this in our body. And it's been in the food supply since I think 1977, where in farmers were, were paid or subsidized because of the corn. But the problem, it's so heavy in this ultra-processed foods, aka junk foods, and flavored and sweetened in a way that makes it taste somewhat good, but highly addictive. And high fructose corn syrup has some very unique properties in that the majority of it is processed by the liver. Okay, not all but the majority. So the liver takes the beating. It creates inflammation. It leads to insulin resistance. It leads to problems with your blood fats and cholesterol. It leads to problems with the fatty liver. It stimulates more hunger. The high fructose corn syrup is very, very different than the fructose from fruit. And it's just ultra refined. Okay. So that's one I would definitely stay away from. Then we get to refined starches. I'm talking about maltodextrin. I'm talking about modified food starch. And uh, like, for example, like in this food right here, we have uh, corn starch, corn syrup, dextrose, all made out of corn. Okay. So that's what this is made out of. So you're feeding kids and some adults. I don't even call it food because it doesn't fit the definition of food. Food is something that gives you fuel and help nourish the body. 
Well, this fuel will not give you energy. It'll make you so tired. And the only nutrients in there are the synthetics that they spray in there, but they're all made from you know chemicals and things like that. And then we get glucose syrup itself. Now, what's interesting, there's no sugar in here from sugar cane, okay? We replace sugar cane, which even I think growing up back in the early 70s, we use a lot of sugar cane and a lot of sodas and things like that. That's all been replaced with this synthetic or highly synthesized sugar, which I think behaves a lot differently than even sugar cane. And so it's all day coincidence, right? With this ultra processed food, which is mainly highly refined corn and other starch products with the GMO on top of that. And if you look at liver function, I think ultra processed foods, which what I just described, is probably at the very top of the list as far as destroying your liver. So the question is, what can you eat to uh, keep the liver healthy? Okay, you wanna eat whole foods. Let's first talk about fats, okay? Uh, some of the best fats uh, would be like olive oil, okay? But also a different type of fat called medium chain triglycerides, MCT oil type fats. And that would be in butter. So you'd wanna cook with butter, put butter in your food, but make sure it's from grass fed, you know, cow milk. But the MCT uh, fats, the medium chain triglycerides are very different because they don't require bile. So they're less stressful on the liver uh, when you consume them. I also found some research that these MCT oils or fats help protect against a fatty liver. You want to make sure you cook with it. And then on your salad, you put olive oil, extra virgin, high quality olive oil. Don't use the seed oils. Make your own salad dressing. Very important if you want to help your liver. Number two, fish, okay? Wild caught fish, preferably high in omega-3 fatty acids because omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory. They're liver protective. They help uh, balance the cholesterol issues. All right, number three, organic pasture raised eggs, not commercial eggs. But egg yolks have probably the highest amount of choline of any food that I know. I'm not sure about uh, liver. Liver might have more choline, but egg yolks have a lot of choline. Choline is great for a fatty liver. If you're deficient in choline, you can end up with a fatty liver, but choline helps remove fat off your liver. Not to mention the high quality protein in eggs, as well as all the other nutrients. The next food on the list is a general category of dark leafy green vegetables or just leafy green vegetables. Why? Because of the vitamin C, because of the folate, which is very important in the liver, because of the magnesium, the potassium, and the phytonutrients. There are so many great properties, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties that are really good for the liver. Now, the only time I wouldn't recommend them, if you had some type of inflammatory gut issue, which you can't deal with the fiber, but for everyone else, I would recommend that. Number five is a type of vegetable. It's a category of vegetables. It's cruciferous. Out of all the cruciferous, radish is probably the best thing for the liver. Unfortunately, I just can't eat radishes. I don't like them. I know my wife likes them. She just can eat them like Candy, I can't consume them, but if I did like them, I would eat a lot of them. Radishes have this higher sulfur compound uh, that is really good for the phase one, phase two detoxification. So we talked about this poison turning into water-soluble things. Well, this enzyme complex takes this poison from very toxic and starts to break it down. And when you consume cruciferous vegetables and other herbs, there are certain things in them that activate our own phase one, phase two detoxifying enzymes, as well as give us uh, enzymes to help break down these chemicals. So this is why we recommend cruciferous. So radishes are good. Second favorite is arugula. It's a little bit bitter. Anything bitter is good for the liver. And of course we get Brussels sprouts, Cabbage, really good for the lower bowel, which uh, support the liver as well. There's this whole connection between your bowel or your friendly bacteria and your liver. If one goes down, the other one goes down. So cabbage is good for anything inflamed in your gut and even in the liver. There's other cruciferous vegetables, but those are the four that I like the most. Number six category, probiotic foods. I just mentioned this, the friendly flora, greatly supports the liver. If you were exposed to an antibiotic or something to destroy your good flora, the liver suffers. 
if you're exposed to something like aspartame or some other synthetic artificial sweetener, that alters the gut microbiome, which then raises liver enzymes and puts you at risk for a fatty liver. So the three top foods for that that I like, sauerkraut, make sure you get it raw. Kimchi, same thing. And then we have kefir. Make sure that it's organic kefir, unsweetened. If you can get goat kefir or sheep kefir, that's even better. Kefir is better than yogurt because it has strains of friendly yeast and friendly bacteria. It has a lot more than just the yogurt. And the last category is grass-fed meat in different forms. You can do lamb, you can do goat, you can do beef, deer meat. I would just make sure that it's grass-fed, grass-finished. That would be the ideal situation if you can. If you can't, well, then get what you can. But I will tell you from personal experience, when I consume high-quality meat, my liver feels great. It feels good compared to me eating like peanut butter or nuts or um, seeds. I have some experience with liver problems. I destroyed my liver I'm eating ultra processed foods and a lot of bad foods for many years. In fact, there was one year I remember I consumed every night uh, margaritas, uh, just every single night and they were sweetened. And at first it was great, right? But then towards the end of the year, Boy, my health started going down, 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 down. And of course, then I replaced it with Ben and Jerry's ice cream, like a pint a day to help myself go into a sugar coma, to help myself sleep. And to precede both of these actions, you know, I lived on junk food for years, Did, never ate anything raw or healthy. Everything was refined, lots of pasta, lots of bread, lots of refined carbohydrates, lots of cereal, and a lot of Doritos and chips. Until I eventually started noticing a heavy, full feeling underneath my right rib cage that little did I know it was my gallbladder, uh, which is connected to the liver. And then it started referring pain to my right shoulder, which I've had this, this pain for years, uh, like at least 12 to 15 years. I didn't know what it was at the time. And of course, I had a lot of bloating and indigestion and I didn't connect the dots. And it wasn't until I started getting rid of these grains and getting rid of the cereal and replacing it with meat that I started noticing relief. And so I started noticing, wow, that, that sensation's going away. So it actually helped my blood sugar. It helped uh, my brain fog, but it took the inflammation away from my liver. Sometimes you hear that meat is bad for you, but they're not differentiating grass-fed, grass-finished beef and processed meat. They put them all in one big category with junk food. Now let's compare that with the fake meat products, right? You have soy protein isolates, you have modified food starch, you have potato starch in there, maybe pea protein, maybe rice syrup, solids, things like that. I mean, think about when you eat that, what you're gonna feel like. I was at Whole Foods a long time ago and uh, I was at the deli and I was really hungry. So I said, wow, those, those chicken wings look pretty darn good, right? So I bought some of the chicken wings. They looked all the same size and shape but I didn't question it. I just said, oh, okay, so there must be just some chicken meat, you know, that's uh, maybe formed into one. Little did I know that was the soy protein isolate fake meat with probably the textured vegetable protein, whatever. Anyway, I was eating it on the way home. I was like, wow, this, is, this tastes pretty good until I got home. And then I got really, really sick, bloated. Uh, my eyes started feeling irritated. Not good. And there's two last supplements I think I'm going to recommend just if you have like cirrhosis of the liver, because the problem with cirrhosis is that a lot of times people are on the um, liver transplant list and there's a long waiting list. Um, but why don't we just maybe try to re revive the liver and to try to reverse this damage if we can in the meantime. So tocotrienols, it's a type of vitamin E, really good for everything liver. The next thing is called tutka. Tutka is a type of bile salt that really keeps uh, the liver healthy and keeps the sludge from building up in the liver. And uh, you'll feel much better if you take that. I would take two in the morning, okay, empty stomach. Take two in the afternoon, empty stomach. I'm not going to recommend any brands. You just have to just search that out and uh, look at various uh, products and the reviews to see if you could find a good one. So those are the two supplements. Now, if you have not seen my video on how to diagnose your liver by using your foot. It sounds kind of funny, but it's really interesting information. I put that video up right here. Check it out.